keeping Charlottesville in line. It's the one and only one Schilling one. Show on News Radio 98.9 and AM 1070 WINA. All right, the Schilling Show continuing here. It's a Turbo Tuesday edition of the program. We welcome back to the Schilling Show. Been a guest many times over the years. Daniel Miller, the president of the Texas Nationalist Movement. And Daniel, welcome back. Great to have you with us always. It's good to be here on Turbo Tuesday. You know, a lot of people have been asking me, where do we go? Where do we go? They're looking around with great distress uh, in America. And so I thought it was time for you and I to talk again and tell us about the Texas Nationalist Movement and what your goals are. Sure. For uh, for those who uh, who missed uh, my, my appearances on here before, uh, the Texas Nationalist Movement is one of the largest independence movements in the world. Uh, we're one of the largest political movements in Texas and North America, and we are singularly dedicated to the political, cultural, and economic independence of Texas. Um, we have a question from a listener who was very interested by all this, and he said, having his understanding that most of the Western states, having watched the Civil War, were careful to include a succession clause in their contract with the United States of America. And I'd like for you to address that. What, what is the reality of this? Yeah, the, the reality is that uh, the the only constitution currently, state constitution, that, that forbids leaving the Union is uh, Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they included it in as part of their statehood. Uh, but Texas, you know, if you look at Texas, and I can't speak to every state constitution, but uh, I know what the Texas constitution says. And the Texas constitution that we currently have is a post-Civil War constitution. And right there, baked in Article One, Section One. Article One of our Constitution is our Texas Bill of Rights. Article One, Section One starts off with the words, "Texas is a free and independent state." Mm -hmm. But what's more important about Article One, Section One is that it ends with these words that says that the perpetuity of the Union depends on the right of local self-government unimpaired to all the states. So it effectively sets a trigger mechanism, and it says, "Look, this Union can only continue." if the right of local self-government is respected. And then Article One, Section 2, you know, for anyone who talks about the Civil War settling anything, our Article One, Section 2 plainly says that all political power is inherent in the people and that the people have at all times the inalienable right to reform, alter, or abolish their form of government in such manner as they may deem expedient. So, you know, if you cut through the... Uh, you know, the, the language of the 1800s, what you get is, is it says that ultimately the right of self-determination is left up to the people of that particular state. And that, you know, obviously is Texas, but it, it goes for any state. You know, it, it doesn't, it, this is not some right that is exclusive to Texas. Um, you know, every state has this right unless they have written it out of their constitution and they can amend their constitution and fix that. Yes, Nevada, I'm looking at you. Daniel Miller, so tell us the, the latest on your efforts within Texas, because I know this is a, a long haul. You've been working at it for a while. What progress are you making? Well, we're making tremendous progress. You know, as you might uh, imagine, and I think the last time that we spoke, Rob, uh, there were a lot of folks out there that were sort of taking a wait-and-see attitude, mm -hmm. you know, when... When, you know, Trump came into office, they, you know, some, not not all, but uh, a, a large chunk of people sat back and they said, okay, look, we're going to get, we're going to give this union one more shot. We're going to see if he actually drains the swamp. And, and I have to tell you, a, a lot of those people that were, you know, deciding to go sit on the bench are coming off the bench and they're putting on the Texas Independence jersey and they're ready to get this thing done. Uh, and it's and I got to tell you, it's great to have those folks and their enthusiasm in. Um, but one one misconception that's ha that that people have about what's happening right now in Texas, Rob, is that it's predicated upon upon this this issue of Trump versus Biden. Mm -hmm. And and you know, as I tell people, look, this may be for a lot of people the straw that broke the camel's back, but it's not the only straw. Right. You know, they 
had all of these grievances that we've talked about for the you know over the years. They're sick and tired of living under 180,000 pages of federal laws, rules, and regulations administered by 440 separate agencies and two and a half million unelected bureaucrats. Texans are tired of going to the polls and voting on issues only to have them overturned overturned by that black-robed priesthood that forces everyone to worship at the feet of Washington, D.C. They're sick and tired of having 100 to $160 billion a year siphoned off into the coffers of Washington, D.C., only, only to be distributed to states like California and New York that can't get their act together. So, you know, this, is, this, this election is just proof positive to people here in Texas that, the, that Washington, D.C. and the federal system are completely irredeemable. So let's go to the the practicality of all of this. Uh, if Texas uh, is successful and the nationalist movement is successful, and now you've got a new uh, state, a uh, country of Texas, how do you determine who would qualify for citizenship? I mean, one of the issues we have in the United States of America is that our borders haven't been respected and our, our sovereignty has not. So what do you do to determine who is a citizen of Texas and who can be a citizen going forward? Look, it's just like any other self-governing independent nation. You know, that they every self-governing independent nation sets its own border and citizenship policies, and Texas would be no different in that regard. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest benefits of Texas independence that we hear time and time again is the ability to set our own border policy and determine our own citizenship policies and, and immigration policies. Uh, time and time again, for well over a decade, the border and immigration have been the top concern expressed by Texans every time a poll is conducted about their attitudes on, on current public policy. It is the number one concern. And what we have seen time and time again is that our border policy and the immigration policies that come out of Washington, D.C. are the typical one-size-fits-none policies mm -hmm. and don't take into account what you know the, the reality here on the ground in Texas. And so Texans really want to be able to to take a direct hand in, you know, how people immigrate here and what constitutes citizenship and, and how we protect our border, uh, because we're the ones that have to deal with it on an everyday basis. Daniel Miller, what about the uh, the debt of the United States of America? And so if Texas were to leave the union, how would the finances be worked out and what would be the burden that Texas would bear? Or would you just walk away from it? Yeah, there's really no walking away. I mean, as as much as we we would like to basically say, hey, you know, deal with it yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is, is there really is no walking away from the portion of of national debt. But where the real issue comes in is how we calculate what that burden is. And so, what we've advocated for post Texas in the TNM is that we have to take everything into account. You know, we're not. It's not to be divided up. We should never accept having it divided up based on uh, population, nor should we have it uh, calculated based on, you know, taking one fiftieth of the national debt. Uh, instead, we have to advocate that Texas gets credit for its 103 to $160 billion on average overpayment, uh, annual overpayment into the federal government. And I can imagine that once you once you begin to look at any way that you would portion that national debt out and apply the overpayments that we've made into the federal government, we would very likely walk away owing zero. Let's go very quickly to the phones. Greg, I have a little bit of time for you to pose a question or a comment, please, to Daniel Miller. Well, my two second cousins, great second cousins died in Alamo, and uh, that uh, characteristic carries through my family. And... Uh, <clears throat> Bottom line is there's 72 million people who are tired of New York City, California, and Philadelphia making the rules for them out here in the rural areas. And I'd like to see your Texas border come on up here through Virginia. And what what would you say of expanding the Texas border for the 72 million people who did vote for Trump, even though it's not a Trump issue? And I'll get off. Okay, Greg, thank you. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we do say that Oklahoma is the largest county in Texas, but that's, you know, all, all, all jokes aside, though, uh, you know, the, the thing that, that we advocate for people is first and foremost is that states are 
sovereign, free, and independent in their own right. So what we're advocating is not an expansion of Texas, but, you know, people reasserting their right of self-determination in the state in which they live. Uh, you know, we communicate uh, with independence movements all throughout the United States and, and frankly, around the world uh, and have since our inception back in 2005. And what I, I think there is a thirst for right now is this feeling that uh, people that live in, in, say, Virginia or one of these other states, they should be examining the same things that we're examining here in Texas with respect to our relationship with the federal government. And, and should be, you know, begin not just examining, but establishing political movements like ours in their state to see their state stand as an independent nation among nations. Now, there, you know, there are naysayers out there who say, you know, their state is, is too small, it doesn't have the economy. But look around the world, pick up a globe, spin it, put your finger anywhere, and, and tell me that the people that you're putting your finger on or any more deserving or any more capable of self-government than your state. You're not going to find it. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that any of the 50 states could leave the union right now and still prosper better outside of the federal union than many of the 192 other independent self-governing nation states around the world. And that's a fact. Daniel Miller, I believe when you're successful, you're going to see the greatest influx of capital, uh, both human and physical capital, into Texas and the greatest outflow of people who don't like liberty and want to be taken care of. It'll be a wonderful sight to behold, and it will be the giant sucking sound in reverse that Ross Perot talked about all those years ago. Tell us very quickly, Daniel, if people want to get more information on what you're doing, Texas National Movement, how they can. Absolutely. Uh, people can visit our website at tnm.me. That's tnm.me. We have an entire section there on the issue of Texas and, and many of the other things that we work on. Or they can give us a phone call uh, anytime at 800-662-1836. I'm very excited for what you're doing, and I always appreciate you joining us here on The Shilling Show. Daniel Miller, thank you so much. Rob, thanks for having me. We'll talk again soon, and we're watching very carefully. All right, a quick word for our friends.